Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of uh, the Tartan Slam series. Um, today, for our speaker, we gladly have uh, Professor Michael Keyes, and he will talk about his work. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, he will talk about his work in uh, Factor Graph, as well as discuss some of the open challenges and recent steps uh, in this area. So some logistics during the talk, if you have any, any questions, please use the meeting pause Q&A platform to post questions um, or upvote any questions you're interested in. Um, we'll also have another uh, discussion at the end of the talk for people that join on the Zoom meeting. So please use the raise hand button on the Zoom and we will unmute you and you can share your comments or ask questions. Um, and then a short introduction for Professor Keyes. Uh, he is an associate research professor in Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. His research focuses on uh, probabilistic methods for robot perception, in particular, efficient algorithms for navigation, mapping, and localization. Uh, prior to joining CMU, he was a research scientist and a postdoctoral associate in the Computer Science Artificial Intelligence, Intelligence Laboratory uh, at Massachusetts Institute in Technology. He received his PhD and MS degrees in computer science from uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, in 2020, he received in, uh, the inaugural Robotic Science and Systems Test of the Time Award. Uh, he was one of the two runner-ups for the 2012 Volt Dissertation uh, Award for the best US PhD thesis in robotics and automation and also received the four runner-ups best paper awards uh, at IROS and ICRA. Uh, for the past four years, he has served as uh, associate editor for IEEE Transactional Robotics. He is now associate editor for IEEE Robotics and Automation Letters. So uh, yeah, Professor Keys, uh, if you're ready, please uh, take it away. Thanks. Henry, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, factor graphs and robust perception. So this is a bit more, um, bit more overview tutorial style at times. Um, and it's kind of a continuation of Sebastian's talk from last week. So Sebastian talked a lot about um, where SLAM is needed, right? So here, another motivation. Um, for a robust perception is needed. Uh, space would be a, a clear application, right? We have rovers on the Mars right now, and if anything goes wrong there, you can't just go up there and, and fix it. And, and if the rover does, the rover has to be autonomous. It has to make its own decisions because of the long radio delays. It's a similar problem for underwater robots, uh, an area that we work in also. Um, where communication is an issue. This time it's not the range that's the problem, but the bandwidth is the issue since you only have acoustic communication. In uh, uh, self-driving cars, obviously, this is quite important. We just saw in the news a couple of days ago that a self-driving car had issues with a few traffic cones, right? And then they have to bring out a driver to that car to actually get it moving again. Um, and uh, drones is maybe one example where we have a relatively robust example. Uh, of, of, a, of an actual drone that's in operation. Service robotics, um, that is a really difficult challenge in indoor environments. But what we really want to get to is having a robot that takes care of all the chores that we don't want to do. So from the title, I'm talking about factor graphs. So what are factor graphs? Uh, a bit more the, the try side of it uh, is, this has been introduced in 2001 uh, by Xiexiang. Uh, the definition is that it's a bipartite graph that expresses a factorization of a function. Right? So there's a function that's factored into a product of individual components. And uh, in, if we look at this in terms of this bipartite graph, uh, we can see there are two different kinds of nodes. One, the variable nodes. The other one, these factor nodes. And uh, the factors would represent constraints that are derived from measurements, for example, in, in the robotics case. And the variables would be uh, uh, quantities such as the robot's position or maybe landmark positions. And so these factor graphs support the sum product algorithm, 
And uh, that means there are many different algorithms that can be implemented there, uh, from belief propagation uh, down to the Kalman problem. And uh, so now the question is, when we get these together, factor graphs and robust perception, how does this work out? Um, what we have on the robot is we have a couple of different sensors. We typically want to use multiple sensors for robustness. So we have some redundancy. And so we get a stream of sensor measurements. We can now use factor graphs to model the typical inference problems that appear. Right? This might be localization, might be a mapping problem, even control problems. And then we can also use them to perform inference with these algorithms mentioned on the previous slide, for example. And then with this understanding of these algorithms and this inference, we can actually develop new inference algorithms that are specifically tailored uh, to this kind of problem. So as an example, the SLAM problem, simultaneous localization and mapping, we have a robot here uh, that at the beginning doesn't know where it is and it doesn't have a map of the environment. What do you do then, right? You use your sensors, you look at the environment. In this case, a landmark, a chair is being seen. Um, this, we call this a landmark, um, sometimes called a feature. Uh, that term is a bit overloaded um, since the feature is often in the feature you detect also. So a landmark, this could be a point um, or it could be a, an object as in this case. The important thing is we get a measurement to that object. And uh, so that landmark measurement is, for example, a pixel coordinate in an image, or it could be a bearing range measurement uh, in a, from a laser range finder. Or if you have objects, it could actually be the full pose of the object. So the position and orientation of the object derived, for example, from a camera image. Now, as the robot is taking a step through the environment, we get another kind of measurement, which is odometry. This could be from real encoders, from inertial, um, maybe from visual odometry also. And uh, the, uh, um, from this new location, we might reobserve the same chair, and maybe in this case, we also see a table, new object. Now, this, this all works nicely, right? We can build a map, we can localize the robot with respect to these objects, so with respect to the map, so we always know where we are. The problem comes in if we travel for a while. So if the robot, let's say, goes through a building, if you take all of these individual measurements and add them up, each of these measurements has a bit of uncertainty. Even the laser range finder is a couple millimeters off typically. And so all of these small errors will add up to some significant drift over longer time. So that drift that accumulates causes the position estimate of the robot to be off uh, tens or hundreds of meters eventually. Um, and that also means that the map that's being created, so the new objects that are being seen are all in the wrong place with respect to the original objects. So how do we solve this? Uh, when the robot comes back at some point and can reobserve, for example, this table, uh, that's what we call a loop closure. So at that moment, when we realize that this is the same table, and this is actually one of the problems in terms of robustness, how do we know it's the same table if our state estimate is off? that table does not appear in the right place, right? But if we can say that this is the same table, then we can use this measurement here to correct the robot's position with respect to the beginning of the trajectory. And therefore we can also correct all of the previous robot poses. And therefore we can also correct all the map that was created along this path. So this is really the, the, the core of the SLAM problem. And the question is how to do this mathematically in terms of inference. And uh, this is where the underlying graph here comes in. It's a factor graph uh, that has robot poses where the robot has been before, right? So these are in two dimensions. They would be just the XY position and the orientation of the robot yaw. And uh, then also for landmarks, uh, in this simplified case, it's simply just the position of a landmark, so X and Y. In real problems, we typically have to deal with three-dimensional poses and positions here. Um, but that, that's essentially the same at the end, just the math gets a bit more complicated. And so this factor graph here is, as I mentioned earlier, bipartite graph. So we have two types of nodes and the edges in between go from one to the other. So there's not an edge from X0 to L1, 
where the factors on. That's the wrong way of thinking about it. Though. That, that's not the way it is. There is an edge from L1 to M1, and there's another edge from M1 to X0. So this means that factors can be connected to more than two variables or to less, right? This is uh, also a factor here with one variable connected. That factor just constrains the first pose. So this is just fixing a coordinate frame. Maybe uh, if you have GPS, there could be a GPS measurement. Otherwise, you could just say the origin, uh, the X0 is at the origin of some arbitrary coordinate frame. Okay, so now, um, there are actually many more examples of factor graphs beyond the basic slam problem on the right here. Uh, post graphs are another common example in um, mapping and localization. So they essentially marginalize out the landmarks. We get rid of the landmarks and we have only a graph over poses and there are connections between these poses. It's not exactly equivalent. Um, we're actually dropping some more information. So this is less accurate, less uh, good than the full slam problem, but it's more cost efficient. So computational cost is much lower and this is why post graphs are often being used. So we'll, you will hear this in the talk, but there's lots of other things you can do with this. Um, uh, tracking, tracking another object, for example, uh, switching system, optimal control even, so you can uh, have the control, um, the control input as variables that you estimate in the factor graph. So you can predict what controls you have to apply to get to a certain position. The slam problem is also closely related to structure for motion and computer vision. Uh, you can actually see it's almost the same structure, uh, except there's no odometry. Right? In structure for motion, you get a set of unordered images. There's no time sequence. And uh, you have to recover the 3D structure of the scene, so point features often. Um, and you have to recover um, where the cameras are located and even the calibrations of the cameras. But you do this offline. You have time to do that. You have all the data. In SLAM, the data comes in incrementally. And, and that uh, fundamentally changes the problem that also affects robustness, as we'll talk about shortly. OK. So after this introduction, I want to talk a bit about factor graphs and Gaussian inference. Uh, this is needed so that we can look at where the problems are with Gaussian inference and how we can possibly get beyond that. So first for this, we should start at what actually goes into a factor inside a factor graph. So what does that factor contain? And so for this, let's look at a simple example, which is a robot observing a landmark. So our robot from before and the chair from before, everything in 2D. And what we need here is some kind of global reference frame, global coordinate frame, that's this X, Y coordinates. And then the robot has its own local coordinate frame, that's X, R and Y, R, which is determined by its position in the global frame, R, X, R, Y and its orientation with respect to the global frame, R theta. And then the landmark itself, the map, we also want to create in this global frame. So it will have coordinates L, X, L, Y. And uh, now if the robot takes a measurement of this chair, that measurement is actually in the local frame of the robot, right? It's a relative measurement, relative X and Y position as observed from the robot sensors. So, if we want to predict this measurement, uh, we can set up a function h of the robot position and landmark position. And uh, this would simply have to subtract the robot's position from the landmark's position in the global frame and then rotate it. And so now we have that vector in the local frame of the robot. So with this prediction function h, we can write a generative sensor model. And this is now assuming Gaussian noise. So under Gaussian noise, the measurement is explained as the uh, predicted measurement, if we knew exactly the state of the world, plus the noise that the sensor introduced, that the measurement process introduces. And so this noise is a zero mean Gaussian noise with some covariance psi here. And so if we have that, now we know what goes into a factor. If we get an actual measurement, we can evaluate the probability of that measurement, P of Z, given R and L, 
Uh, of course, R and L are not given, right, in the inference problem. But assuming if we would know R and L, we could evaluate what the probability of Z is. And that will later let us determine what R and L should be in order to maximize this probability over all of the measurements. So, and that probability is simply a Gaussian density. It's a multivariate Gaussian because we typically work in n dimensions here. Um, but the key thing is the exponent here is a Mahalanobis distance, right? It's the difference of the predicted measurement and the actual measurement squared. And this whole thing under some um, uh, covariance psi. Equivalently, we can also write this as a cost function. We will typically, instead of maximizing probabilities, which are a bit, um, uh, a bit um, complex here, uh, we can simply look at minimizing a cost function. And for that, what is relevant is the exponent up here. So just a negative exponent. So we just have the Mahalanobis distance. And this is where we will get to least squares at the end. All right, so key thing is, right, we have the actual measurement, which is Z, and we have the predicted measurement based on our sensor model, H. Okay, now we can solve um, the graph, right? So the graph corresponds to this factorization of a uh, function. That function here is the probability over the variables. So what's the probability of a, of a certain configuration of variables, so robot states and landmark positions? Um, this is simply the product over the individual probabilities of, for each measurement. So each individual measurement appears here, and the product of these is the, uh, the total. And so what we want to do is we want to maximize this probability. So we want to find the state estimate that maximize this probability that best explains all of the measurements that we got. And under the assumption that everything is Gaussian, all the noise is Gaussian in the measurements, we can end up with a minimization of a sum of squares. Right? This is by taking the negative log of the probabilities, we end up with just the exponents here from the previous slide. So now we have a sum of squared terms Again, this generative sensor model and the actual measurement appear here for each individual measurement, so summing over i. And now finally, if h is linear, right, then we can simply end up with a linear least squares problem. We can gather all of these terms of the sum, stack them into a big matrix and a big vector, and we simply have this a theta minus b squared that we want to uh, minimize. So we want to find the theta, the state vector that minimizes this expression. Now in general, the H's are not linear, right? In the previous example, you saw sine and cosine from the rotation. So it's clearly not linear. So then what we need to do is we need to linearize that function, solve a linear problem, use that to get a better estimate and then relinearize again. So, and we have to do this iteratively in a in a standard nonlinear least square solver, uh, such as Gauss Newton, Lambert Markwell, Powell Stockyak. Um, the key insight here now of efficiency is that this A matrix is actually a sparse matrix, right? It's a huge matrix. Uh, all of the variables are in the columns here, poses and landmarks. So this might be millions of variables for a big problem. And then the rows are the measurements. So we can look at here the diagonal or block diagonal. It's not even block diagonal. If we zoom in, each row here will have two poses occupied, right? It's an odometry measurement from one to the next pose. Similar down here are the landmark measurements. So each row has a pose and a landmark corresponding to it. And all the other entries are zero. Okay, so brief history of algorithms for solving this. Um, so this we had called smoothing and mapping. Um, and uh, so Sam uh, from Dr. Zeus, um, uh, Sam I am. Uh, so square root Sam, because we take the square root of that matrix before, we take, we get an upper triangular sparse matrix, we exploit sparsity, and therefore we can efficiently solve this. This has actually been well known in structure for motion, um, but the key thing is applying this to a real time problem when every step you only do one iteration of a nonlinearly square solver 
then you add the new measurements and you um, solve again. So from there on, we can incrementalize, right? We can have new measurements that get incrementally added into this factorization. That was actually my PhD work. Um, and this is also kind of well known how to update a matrix factorization, right? Use Gibbons rotations, and it will just fix the entries of the, uh, of the factorization that have to change. Everything else you don't have to recompute, saves a lot of computation. But this is limited to linear systems. And again, SLAM is basically always nonlinear. So uh, here in, in my thesis work, we basically ha had to do periodic batch steps where I went back to the square root sum formulation uh, every 100 steps or so, and then we could solve problems. It gets more interesting if you go to graphs. And um, so, so this algorithm is called incremental SAM or ISAM. And so ISAM2 is an algorithm that can work with nonlinear systems. And this was made possible by going away from matrices and understanding what these operations are with respect to graphical models. And so it turns out the sparse matrix representation is simply the wrong representation. What underlies this matrix factorization is a tree structure. Once you have that tree structure, then you can do incremental updates even in a nonlinear system. And um, this ISM2 algorithm is available in the GTSM library. Okay, so I can't explain the whole algorithm. Uh, this, this will take uh, many hours, um, but uh, that's what I do in my lecture typically. But so here I thought of a very simple example that still can give you the basic idea. This is gonna look at the chain only. So let's assume at the moment we have two variables. We have an odometry constraint and some kind of prior on the first pose. So this means you have two different factors here. I didn't write them as probabilities. They could be probabilities potentially. So uh, one factor over x1, another factor over x1 and x2. And so now to do inference, the key underlying algorithm is variable elimination, another algorithm that has been known beforehand. Um, so we do variable elimination. We have to eliminate one variable at a time. So let's choose x1 first. We end up with a, uh, we, we basically modify the uh, original potentials here into a conditional. So we want to get rid of x1. What we get is some probability on x1 given x2. So if we knew x2, we could determine x1. And then we have some additional new factor on x2 through this elimination algorithm. That's simply rewriting the original probabilities here into a different form, right? There's nothing magical about it. But in terms of the graphical model, that means we now have a base net here between x1 and x2, and we still have a factor graph on x2. Uh, they could be written separately, but we'll, we'll just mix them up here um, for convenience. And um, so this was the first step. The second step is eliminating x2. That's really easy because x2, so this factor on x2 is the only piece of information here. It's not conditioned on anything else. So in this case, we just end up with a probability on X2 conditioned on nothing else. So what we have is the eliminated base net, which is as simple as it can be, right? Just one conditional link here. And there's also this uh, prior on X2, which doesn't, doesn't really show up in a base net. Okay, so did we solve the problem? Um, not yet, right? What we want is a state estimate. So there's actually a two-stage process. This was stage one, elimination. The second stage is we have to find the solution. So we have two terms here. The first one is P of X1 given X2. Now X2 we don't have, so we cannot calculate X1. So we go to the next term, P of X2. Ah, this does not depend on anything else. It's a Gaussian density and we can determine its mean. Right? It's kind of straightforward to find the mean for this. So this means we can solve for x2, and then we can plug this into the conditional for x1. Now x2 is given, and that means we can also solve for x1, and we have the solution for our state. So we know what x1 and x2 are. We know the means of both. We might also need to calculate the covariances if we, if we are interested in that. Okay, so that's the basic idea for chain. If you do this on a more general graph that has loops, uh, it gets a bit more involved than it, it, it 
it takes a bit longer to explain. Um, but in essence, the, this is it for variable elimination. So now we can do something interesting with this. We can implement a fixed leg smoother. A fixed leg smoother is simply a chain of poses, right? Where over time we add a new pose every time step and we try to estimate the most recent state. To get better results, we are also estimating the previous states. But to be real time, we cannot include all of the history, right? Because that, that this will just grow in computation with every time step. So fixed leg smoother defines a lag here, for example, of three. And we care about these three states, the last three states, and everything before we marginalize out. Now, the elimination we did before did actually marginalization as a side effect. So assuming we have we got a variable ordering right, we eliminate x1 first here, then we can simply drop x1 and it's equivalent to marginalization. If I go back briefly, the this factor on X2 that was created here came out of marginalizing variable X1. The difference to marginalization is we keep that conditional so we can later calculate X1 also. Okay, so we have done marginalization for our fixed X model. Um, we get that for free. So now we get a new measurement, the actually two measurements, an odometry measurement, and let's say also some global measurement, GPS also an X5, a new, state right and uh, we have to do one more thing we have to get this factor from previously that was created in the previous elimination of x3 um, uh, this takes a bit time to explain but uh, i'll skip that here we have to go back to that factor and then we restart the elimination from here so instead of eliminating all the variables again x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 we just have to do x4 and x5 and what we end up with is this new chain um, that is a base net. And uh, we can now marginalize out X2 uh, to keep the lag at length three, right? So we have just implemented a fixed leg smoother as it is being used in the state of the art of visual inertial odometry. Um, except in visual inertial odometry, there are landmarks, it gets a bit more complicated. It's not just a chain, um, but the, the, the idea is the same. And uh, very interestingly, if we implement a fixed leg smoother with lag one, what do we get? Um, this is a Kalman filter. So the Kalman filter is always marginalizing out the previous state, and it's only interested in the most recent state. And uh, so this is true for linear systems here, what I explained. If we go to nonlinear systems, it adds a bit of complications, but it, it's not too difficult. And once you get there, you can understand why the Kalman filter cannot relinearize. And you can also understand why in a fixed leg smoother like this, you could not relinearize any factor that's connected to X3 after X2 is marginalized out. Um, so working with these graphical models is really interesting because it, it gives you a lot of understanding in, in how these algorithms work and the connections between them. Okay, so if we do this on a full, on an arbitrary graph, we end up with this ISM2 algorithm that has a tree structure underneath the base tree that you can see on the left here. And you can see the nodes of that tree in red are the ones that have to be changed in every step. Gray is what doesn't change. So on the right side, you can see the map that is being created incrementally um, as this graph is being solved. You can see a lot, does not have to be touched. So we can save a lot of computation here. There are only changes near the top of the tree. Sometimes there are bigger changes. For example, if we do a loop closure here somewhere, then of course all the variables along that loop and some outside the loop have to be recomputed. And this is when you see colors other than green popping up by right? this a bit of red or yellow in here. That means a larger number of nodes have to be redone. And as more loops are closed, there will be more cost to do this operation. So here, for example. OK. So let me quickly move on. Oh, time is actually moving very quickly here. So I'll, I'll uh, almost skip over a few things. So we can do visual inertial navigation with this. Um, I, I think Vadim Indelman's paper from 2013 was the first that used factor graphs and, and the um, uh, pre-integration 
in combination to, to solve these problems. And this is kind of standard now in the community. Um, with these insights, you can figure out, here's actually a factor graph now for the actual um, fixed leg smoothing problem for visual inertia with landmarks, so more, a bit more complicated. But you can then figure out how to mitigate effects created by marginalization that, that make, make it more costly. You can do sparsification. Um, for robustness, we can also incorporate multiple cameras. So we can look in multiple directions. Uh, this helps because if some camera doesn't, there's no texture in that direction where it's looking, or there's motion blur because of fast motion, then hopefully we can still track based on the other cameras. And uh, uh, there's a lot of other things that can be done underwater robotics with sonar sensors, acoustic structure for motion, for example. Um, we can also introduce equality and inequality constraints. This is fairly recent work by my student Paloma Sodi. And uh, this is interesting because we can now force that a trajectory, for example, doesn't cross walls. Um, or we can, in the manipulation context, enforce constraints. Uh, but this has also been used by others in the community for a lot of different things. For example, steep, simultaneous trajectory estimation and planning. Um, so looking both at the state estimation, which is the past, and the future, which is the planning aspect. That's one optimization problem, one factor graph. Robust sensor fusion, um, so trying to uh, um, uh, uh, trying to figure out which which constraints are wrong in this context. Uh, learning semantic maps, uh, even occupancy grid mapping. Okay, so this was the overview over Gaussian inference in factor graphs. Now the question is. Um, why do we need to talk about robust perception at all? Doesn't this solve the problem? And so the title here is Beyond Gaussian Inference, so apparently it, it doesn't solve it. So if we look at the issues that uh, arise in practice, so failure uh, causes here, uh, perceptual aliasing is one. So if you look at these two images of a hallway, are they the same hallway or not? You actually have to close, look very closely to know if they are. And, and you can realize why right, there's, a, there's a, a piece of furniture here, a bench or so that's not in the other hallway. Uh, there are also some more less subtle changes like this thing on the wall is further down in this. So apparently they are actually two different hallways in the same building, probably, uh, probably maybe above each other, maybe parallel to each other. It's very easy for a computer vision algorithm to say they are the same, right? And, and then you have a problem because you added a wrong link into your graph. And if you do this here, we have an example um, from, a, from Ed Olson's paper that shows if you add a wrong link, not too bad yet. If you add multiple three wrong links here, uh, that map does not look so good anymore. And if we add multiple, many wrong links, the map becomes useless. And so this is closely related to the Gaussian assumption. We'll get to this in a second. There are a number of other failure causes. Uh, wheel slip, for example, right? You, you are measuring the, uh, how often a wheel turns, but if the wheel is slipping, that doesn't really tell you anything about how far you're moving. So your assumptions are wrong. Your measurement model is wrong. Sensor failure, for example, motion blur, that's actually not really the sense of failing, right? It's, it's, you don't get good data from it motion blur, um, lack of, lack of um, texture information that you can track. But also the nonlinear cost functions that underlie, they actually result in non-Gaussian posteriors that we still need to approximate using a Gaussian in our uh, estimation algorithms like ISM2. Everything has to be Gaussian. Um, and here's another example where if we do deal with range, for example, underwater with sonar again, then you end up with these bimodal distributions, right? So the red part here, there are actually two different places where a point could be. And again, this you cannot model with the Gaussian density, or not efficiently, at least. So the question is, how do we deal with this in the back end? And so our focus today is on the back end, on the optimization. There are actually many other complementary approaches to robustness, and they need to be taken into account first. They would be on the front end side. So how we process the incoming sensor data, how we calculate correspondences. So for example, feature descriptors, 
if you use SIFT, uh, FAST, or deep learning-based features, the scriptors nowadays, they help us in making less mistakes in the data association. Then if you calculate correspondences with RANSEC, for example, or maybe with modern deep learning algorithms like SuperQ, um, that help us in reducing the number of mistakes we make in, the, in assigning these correspondences, in essentially creating the factors that go into the graph. And we can go even further. We can look at multiple time steps. We can look at the, at the whole sequence and look for consistency in the measurements. And uh, so but whatever we do here, at some point, a mistake gets through. For example, because of perceptual ambiguity, because things look exactly the same, and none of these methods can differentiate between that. So now the question is, how do we deal with this in the optimization? And if we throw ISM2 at this, it's actually going to fail. Right? It's, it creates a map that's useless at the end. So what is the problem, really? And how do we model it with factor graphs? So here's one example of an ambiguity. Um, here we have a robot that is seeing two doors. It's creating a map with these two doors. Then the robot is moving a bit forward. Uh, its odometry tells it it's one meter forward. And now there are two possibilities. The one meter does not agree with the map. There are two options. The first option is we moved half a meter only, and we're actually seeing the same doors again, right? We just moved a bit closer to the doors than in the first example. Um, the other option is we moved one and a half meters. And uh, we see the second door and a new door. So we have to add a door to the map. Now, from these measurements that we get, we can actually not tell which of these options it is. We could model this in the factor graph with a multimodal factor. So this factor has two different options in it. And this is actually really, um, we, we could model this with an additional discrete variable up here, a switch variable right, that decides it's one or the other. Uh, that also connects to this factor, or we can marginalize out that discrete variable, and then they end up with this multi-mode factor. That's how we got here. And there are a couple of such factors that are commonly relevant. Um, so the one we just described here, there are two options. Uh, the other one is on the association side, there are two options. So you're seeing a, uh, the, uh, the table again, but you don't know if it's the same table as before or a new table. So you can model this in the graph. Um, and then another option is for loop closures, for example, uh, there's the option that the loop closure is valid or not, right? This is the same hallway or it's actually not. So it's a Boolean um, decision in here. Uh, again, the question is how do we solve this? The problem is the posterior of any of these factor graphs is no longer Gaussian, right? It has multiple modes necessarily and they cannot be represented by a Gaussian density. Okay, one way to circumvent this problem a bit is to use robust estimators. So this all explains a bit, uh, or I have to explain first why we have a problem at all uh, with this Gaussian assumption. Right? We have a cost function here that's quadratic that corresponds to the Gaussian PDF. Right? That's the exponent of the Gaussian is this quadratic function. And so if you have an outlier or something that's much further out than three sigma, then the cost of that outlier is humongous, right? It's far outside my slide here, so I cannot point up there where that cost is. And because we minimize the sum of squares, right? This term is the dominant term. So what needs to happen, this cost has to move closer towards three sigma. And all the other hundreds of measurements that are actually good will have to move away from their correct solution. Um, to a higher, somewhat higher cost, so that we can minimize the overall sum over all of these. And this is why these maps get completely messed up. So the solution is to modify that cost function to not increase quadratically, but to increase linearly, for example, like in the pseudo Huber cost function. Um, Cauchy functions even a bit below linear. There are actually many of these functions. You can find this in Hartley and Sisselman in the appendix in the second edition. That's where the, these are from. And uh, the key thing is we can modify our least square solver by simply multiplying with some attenuation factor. For the standard case, it's simply one, right? We don't change anything. 
for these cases, we multiply with a value that's less than one, the further away gets smaller, the further away we get from the mean. So we essentially downweigh uh, outliers. And the exact function here, the exact attenuation gives rise to different um, uh, cost functions. And if you want to know more about this, you might want to look at this re uh, recent paper here from um, Cyril Stachner's group on adaptive robust kernels for nonlinear least cost problems, um, where you don't have to choose a specific one, but it can automatically adapt. So there are other solutions. Oh, okay, yeah. So the problem, of course, with these is even an outlier still has an impact on the result. It's not that the outlier is being removed. It will still uh, mess up the result a bit. So you don't get exactly the right solution, but it's not catastrophic. Uh, there are other solutions such as max mixtures. So instead of looking at this bimodal mixture as a mixture of Gaussians, which is really the sum of the Gaussians, we can look at this as the maximum of the two at any given point. Uh, this is not exactly probabilistic anymore, but, but this works. Uh, the problem is it's a local decision which mode to uh, use, basically. And locally, you don't have enough, the, the solver doesn't have enough information, so you can get stuck in local minima at the end. Switchable constraints, another such idea where we have this discrete variable separately, uh, but in order to fit it into a continuous solver, Lisca solver, it's actually implemented as a continuous switch variable. Uh, again, this is a somewhat local decision making. A much more global solver, uh, but only specific for postgraphs, has recently been introduced uh, by uh, David Rosen, Luca, Colin, and John Leonard. Uh, that's SE Sync. Um, so, specifically for postgraphs, we can um, find a semi definite relaxation and solve that. Uh, and then, under certain conditions, uh, we can find, uh, and some conditions are noise, for example, uh, we can find a globally optimal solution. And we can even, uh, with some computational cost, we can verify that this is the correct minimum. So if you look at the general cost function here, what our iterative solver typically does, like ISM2, we need to have a good initial estimate, and then we can iteratively go down and find this minimum here. But if our initial estimate is off, let's say it's over here, right? then ISM2 will converge to this minimum. And we have no idea that this is not a global minimum. So this is what this overcomes, but only for specific cases of postgraphs. All right, so another option is we completely get rid of the Gaussian assumption. We go to non-Gaussian inference. Problem is this is an intractable problem in general. So one way to do this is non-parametric belief propagation. And so we apply that. Uh, th this is very expensive to do. Uh, we apply this to the base tree. You can stretch it a bit. You can get to larger problems. You can solve something that's uh, relatively relevant, at least practically. But it's still expensive to do, and you get an approximate solution and only marginals. Um, there might be more work that can be done in this direction to, to, um, to do this better or faster. Uh, this is pretty cool though, because you actually do get, um, uh, you do get a uh, non-Gaussian posterior that's approximated using kernel density estimates. Um, so that, that's something that, that typically you cannot get to. Um, another option, and this is what we recently dug out, a kind of an older idea is multi-hypothesis tracking. This is typically done to track an object like a plane or so. And, uh, uh, that means you do this on a Kalman filter, so a small state. If you apply this to the SLAM problem, this is terribly expensive because you have to run n different solvers in parallel. And right, we, we already have an issue with running a single one in real time. So now we have to run here 64 of these. And this is only for six different multimodal factors here. Right? We have two to the six or 64 different base trees we would have to track. Uh, this is not really doable. So the typical way in multi-hypothesis tracking is then to do pruning. You have to get rid of the least likely hypotheses at a given time, which of course runs the risk that you throw away the correct one and future measurements would show that this is the correct one, but right now you make a wrong decision. So again, this is an intractable problem. 
And that means we'll only be able to find some approximate solution without guarantees in general. Um, so the idea here is with multi-hypothesis, we can actually again exploit that there is computation done multiple times, this time between the different hypotheses. So here's a small example with two different multimodal factors. So there are four different factor graphs essentially that need to be solved. They are shown down here. But in these four factor graphs, depending on the order in which we eliminate variables, right, the first variable here is the same for all of them. The second is the same and only the third one, there's a split, there are two options. And then the fourth one, there are all options. So we can actually avoid calculating this four times by doing everything in a single base tree. So combining everything, all the inference in one base tree and then separately tracking the hypotheses in a hypothesis tree. So each click here is now associated with a layer of the hypothesis tree. So we know what the hypotheses mean, how they map to the final set of hypotheses. Um, so with this, we can actually solve interesting problems. Uh, here's again this Victoria Park data set from before. The theoretical number of modes here far exceeds the number of atoms in the universe, right? So that, that's why it's intractable. Uh, there's just no way to get the exact solution to it. Um, but we're lucky here. Uh, I mean, mo a lot of these modes are zero probability, right? So we're lucky we, we get the correct mode in here. Um, up here's another example where we track. And you can actually see multiple hypotheses, right? At the beginning here, uh, there's only a single one, which is the blue one here. Uh, oh, actually there are two, the blue one and the magenta one, right? There's this blue to magenta, these are hypotheses. In the next step, there are actually four different hypotheses at this point that you can see. And in the last step, there are enough measurements now that there's only a single hypothesis left. But if we don't track these different hypotheses, if we just choose the best one locally, we end up with a red trajectory, which is completely useless. Um, we made a mistake at the beginning, right? The, the, the wrong hypothesis essentially was looked like the better one. And so this means you can, you can never recover. With multiple hypotheses, you can recover. So this is pretty cool. Um, so my former PhD student, Ming Xiao, actually worked on this and he came up with it when he worked on mapping with planar surfaces. Uh, so this was work mapping indoor environments, extracting planar surfaces. And the problem is it's very easy for something to go wrong, right? Um, in, in this work, inertial sensor was additionally used. We, we used structural constraints and we can create these maps if you move carefully, if you know how to move the sensors through the building, you get pretty good maps. Uh, if you're less careful, if you move quickly also, then you end up with maps like shown on the right here. Again, the same problem, a single, we just take the best solution locally. Uh, and at the end, we have something that's useless. Uh, if we take multiple hypotheses into account, we end up with this interesting map. It's actually for a couple of different maps overlaid. Uh, and several of these are wrong. We can see it. One of them is correct, but only future measurements that we don't have yet would allow us to figure out which of these is correct. Uh, and again, for this bigger map, it turns out at the end here, there's only one hypothesis left and, and that's the uh, uh, correct one. Okay, the really interesting thing about multiple hypotheses is um, we can actually use this actively. So we can have a planner that takes into account the ambiguity and tries to keep ambiguity low so we don't have to do pruning. So in this case here, um, Ming, um, Apply this to exploration of an environment. And uh, uh, you can see the number of hypotheses here growing up to uh, eight, so two to the three. Uh, and then the, the planner at two to the two, so at four hypotheses, is actually starting to take steps to disambiguate. Um, so it's going back to a place where, where it thinks it can remove the ambiguity. In the meantime, there's a bit more ambiguity coming, another ambiguous measurement, but then it can drop it down. And so so this way we can drop it, uh, we can keep it relatively low and hopefully avoid having to do pruning. So the key idea here is with this active disambiguation, if you solve, if you, if you can find the global minimum even of a cost function, it doesn't necessarily help you because um, 
the, the global minimum is not necessarily the correct state of the world. If you can find that there is ambiguity and that there are multiple possible solutions, right, then you can use that information to make better decisions in the future. Um, and this is what we're trying to do here. Okay, so to conclude, so we have a bit of time for questions left. Um, I've talked about factor graphs that are a useful tool um, to model many robotics problems, so even beyond SLAM, uh, but also to understand and create new inference algorithms that are specifically tailored to the problems that we encounter. And we looked at fixed leg smoothing and Kalman filter, but most, more generally, this ISM2 algorithm um, came out of that. And then we talked about that robust perception is difficult, right? It's generally actually intractable. We quickly end up with a number of solutions that exceeds the number of atoms in the universe, even for small problems. Um, but for some uh, limited problems, um, for, for some specific problems, we can find limited solutions to this. And so depending on the problem that you have, robust estimators may be sufficient. Um, maybe the global postgraph optimizer helps you if you just have a postgraph. Um, Non-parametric belief propagation, if you have sufficient time to actually calculate that. Uh, Multi-hypothesis, something you can do in real time, but you risk pruning the wrong hypothesis. Um, and then in this context, we talked about how to use the knowledge of ambiguity for planning. And there are big open problems, obviously, here in how we really solve this intractable problem um, in, in a better way. So I want to acknowledge your funding from many different agencies and industry, um, many collaborators that contributed uh, to this uh, work and past work here from CMU and also MIT, Michigan, Georgia Tech, Maynooth, and uh, BYU. Uh, and then especially the many great students that worked on these different topics um, over the years. So here um, we have time for discussion. Cool, thanks, Professor, for the amazing talk. Um, yeah, we do have um, quite a bit of questions. Okay, that's good. Um, if we didn't have questions, I could throw out a few here. Uh, we can still look at these, but um, we can start with audience questions, maybe. Okay, uh, I guess maybe we should uh, start with the audience question first. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one uh, is, so how do multimodal measurements, like for example, different sources like MU, vision, laser, or GPS fit into uh, a, a factor graph? Like, do we usually maintain uh, multiple graphs or uh, using a single graph, mm -hmm. uh, I guess with different factors? Or is yeah. there any advantages, disadvantages with two different schemes, I guess? Yeah, so that, that is a really good question. So, so they easily fit into a factor graph. The question is more, how do you then solve that factor graph? Mm -hmm. so, so we can easily model that with this ambiguity, but we can now not use the Gaussian solvers anymore because it, it just violates the Gaussian, noise, Gaussian assumption. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that, that this is a pretty, pretty open problem. Right? I, I showed a couple of ways of dealing with it from fully non-parametric um, to uh, the multi-hypothesis solution where we track multiple solutions. But so none of these can really guarantee you that you get the right solution at the end. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the only guarantee so far that we know of is in the connection of postgraphs under certain assumption uh, with SE Sync, um, with, with this algorithm that was recently introduced. Um, uh, in, in this somewhat bit limited, but really relevant context, right? There we can actually get guarantees. Okay. Um, however, again, you, you actually get the global minimum, but the global minimum doesn't necessarily correspond to the state of the world, right? It's the best solution based on all the measurements you have so far, but mm. future measurements might actually change that. And, and there might be another mode that's similarly likely that then becomes more likely with the next measurement. So, so this is quite a tricky problem, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, sort of related to that uh, problem, I feel like there's uh, ambiguity 
So for example, like when you go back to the same place, it's sort of, uh, actually if you encounter a similar uh, scene, you can differentiate those two different environments. And there's also like degenerated cases where for example, uh, very heavy motion blur or uh, the laser measurements are geometrically degenerated in one direction. Um, so here's another question uh, sort of related to that. So uh, given sort of, for example, three types of factors uh, have IMU pre-integration factor, um, a laser factor or a vision reprojection factor. So if we were to optimize these uh, residual in a single optimization, so is there any way that we can balance these factors through, for example, covariance matrix or noise model? And uh, is it possible in a factor graph uh, formulation? Yeah, so in, in, the, in the factor graph, what we see in the individual factors is, um, this, may, maybe I jump to that slide quickly, the, the no, where is it here? The, the, um, uh, we need to have this underlying sensor model, which includes the actual uncertainty of the sensor. So if we have that, then the factor graph can easily mix all of these together and, and the result, assuming there are no outliers, right? Assuming everything is correct, um, the result will be exactly what, what it should be. In practice, it is difficult to come up with these uncertainties. So for example, if you do visual odometry, you calculate a constraint from images you can calculate the covariance matrix, but there are a lot of things that can go wrong in that. And that uncertainty here might then be wrong that you plug into the factor graph. Mm -hmm. And so that then means that, that that measurement is weighted, weight correct incorrectly with respect to the other sensors like laser and inertial. And, and that leads to problems. So, so this is actually one challenging problem in practice in mixing different sensors together, even though we do this all the time. Uh, and it's it's a bit tolerant to make to, to not being exact on, um, but but if these uncertainties are way off, then it, mm -hmm. uh, the the output will also be wrong. Yeah, um, but actually, I guess people are really interested in uncertainty <laughs> modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there's another question on how do, how do we evaluate the uncertainty of sort of laser or visual mm -hmm. odometry? I guess either using factor graph or non-factor graph uh, methods. Mm -hmm. So I feel like once once the factor gets added into the factor graph, it sort of uh, the, it sort of leaves up to the optimization problem. Then um, I guess before we add it to the factor graph, is there any way that we can sort of identify these um, uncertainties? So, so there might actually be a solution to learn it within the factor graph. And so, so there might be another talk in August by, by one of my students, Paloma Sodi, who would, who would talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so where we actually do learning over, the, over, the, over this whole optimization of, of a graph, of a factor graph. Um, but so the typical way right now is we would characterize the actual sensor first. So mm -hmm. that, that's relatively easy. Right, it might be time consuming, but um, you can look at the spec sheets of the, of the laser to get the uncertainty, or you can do your own experiment with di at different distances, at different orientations of surfaces, at different materials. Um, you can um, figure out what is the uh, uncertainty in the measurement that you get back versus ground truth in your controlled experiment. So, so this would be the way to determine the sensor uncertainties and, and that can definitely be done uh, fairly well. Now, if you use that sensor to then do laser odometry, for example, this gets more tricky. Now you know the uncertainty of all of these measurements, mm -hmm. um, but if you combine them and you do some kind of ICP or LOM algorithm over that, um, what is the resulting uncertainty of that alignment? And, and there are many things that can go wrong. For example, if the scene is um, somewhat uh, poorly constrained, uh, close to degenerate. Uh, so for example, if you're in a long corridor that has no features, that, that's just smooth walls, no doors or anything, mm -hmm. then uh, the, the sensor measurements are noisy. So you will actually 
get an alignment along that corridor, even so you cannot actually uh, figure out the alignment along the corridor theoretically. But because of the noise in the sensor measurements, you will get an alignment. And if you calculate a covariance, the uncertainty along that corridor will not be very large. And that's obviously wrong. And, and so, yeah, these, these are the problems you run into in practice. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe learning could be a solution that, yeah. This... Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. Uh, yeah, we do have scenarios where uh, the status may get gripped in a very difficult environments, like a very long corridor. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty interesting problem. Um, we, we do have a raised hand. So Zhou Yang, Zhou Yang, do you wanna, um, uh, let's see if yes. I can unmute. So, hi, Professor Michael Case. Thanks for this wonderful talk. So I do wanna ask you a question is that, uh, is it possible to combine this learning-based system with the factor graph in the future? Or is it possible to compose an end-to-end differentiable system with the factor graph? So what do you think about that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So, so there have been some efforts in making uh, some, some of these solvers, uh, at least the, the, the batch solvers, differentiable. So you can use them in end-to-end -end learning. Um, I'm, I'm currently not aware for the incremental solver um, yet how to do that. Um, on the other hand, you can also go the other way around, right? You can use the, your solver and learn things that are inside, like these sensor models. Um, you could do that by learning. And, and this is one thing we've, we've recently explored. Um, and, and maybe they are better there are still better ways. I mean, an, another option would be to just throw away these solvers and have an end-to-end -end learning system. Um, I, I don't think that's the right way uh, to go, but maybe I'm proving wrong at some point. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're running out of time actually, uh, but we do have, uh, I guess maybe we can do one more question. This sort of, more on the education side. So um, the, the question is, do you have any uh, share uh, resources to learn about uh, the pulse graphs uh, being used for SLAM? So I guess the vector graph and the, uh, the post, pulse graph formulation in general. Yes, so I'll, I'll make the slides available later and I'm actually, maybe I missed to add the reference in here, okay. So the, there's a recent 2017 factor graphs for robot perception. Um, that's an over 100 page document uh, that gives an overview of, of the math and, and also related algorithms. So I'll, I'll add that to the, uh, to the slides before making that available. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, we, we also have a question from uh, Professor Chris, Chris Atkinson. Um, so Professor, if you want to go ahead. And talk about. So somehow my uh, raise hand button has gone away, but here's what I want to ask. So the systems you're talking about have the property that the more you know, which is the bigger the maps are, the stupider and slower they get. And that's troubling. Uh, so how do you deal with that? And, you know, of course, one way is hierarchical schemes and another way is dimensionality reduction. And another way is map everything into latent spaces. But how are you going to get systems that the more they know, the faster and smarter they are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So, so we actually um, spend a lot of time on, on working on this. Fixed leg smoothing is one example for that. Uh, but obviously, you lose all the history. So that doesn't allow you to close loops anymore. Um, another option is that you uh, construct a graph in a way that it doesn't get larger over time. That means it only grows with the size of the environment. Um, so this is called re uh, reduced post graph with it, I think back in 2013. Another option is that as your graph gets larger, um, but parts of the graph are pretty stable now, you have enough measurements, you can actually simplify that. You can throw away parts of it. So you have to do marginalization and then sparsification in that. And so we've done that in, in um, 
contexts where we operate over, over longer time on, on ships, for example, with underwater robots, or where we later want the map that we can use for relocalization. Uh, but in, in, and then the other, the other option is that at some point you're switching essentially to localization. You don't add any more information to the system. If your uncertainties are low enough, um, you simply localize off of that map. And if you get to an area that you haven't seen before, after all, then at that point you can start adding again into the graph. Um, but yeah, this, this is certainly a, a challenging problem in practice. And, and one, one uh, issue there maybe with the ISM2 algorithm is that it's difficult to predict what the computation is in the next step, right? Because it, it adapts basically to what needs to be recomputed. Um, it's, it's very difficult to know ahead of time how much computation is spent. So you have to think of parallelizing the, the, this backend computations with the, uh, the, the optimizations that are more at the front of the sensor measurements so that you can keep up with what comes in. And we've done some work in that space also, but, but again, more work um, might be needed there. So what about taking into account distinctiveness of landmarks and eventually forgetting stuff that's not very distinctive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a couple of options there, right? We can really go to semantics in the first place, right? As I indicate on this slide here, landmarks, chairs, uh, because that reduces the number of objects you have to deal with in a scene rather than having hundreds or thousands of point features. Uh, you see maybe 10 or 20 different objects at a given time. Um, so this, this is one way. Uh, and uh, um, I, I guess what, what you just mentioned would be more widely applicable. Uh, you could apply to point features, uh, looking at saliency, uh, for example, um, where you focus. So, so I guess we've used this in a different context. We've used it in the context of if you want to relocalize, you want to go back to places where there are salient features. Um, but I guess the same idea could be used to uh, uh, reduce your map to only the things that are relevant for you to localize. Yeah, I suppose you could factor utility into this and only remember landmarks that get you to the things that pay off. Yep. Or something. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. So I would just like to observe that this isn't limited to SLAM. This is also about how you navigate your memory of past experience and how you relate past knowledge of solving problems to current problems. Hmm. So that's really close to learning in general, maybe. Well, the idea is, you know, you learn a little bit about transitions and you learn a lot about recognizing where you've been before or what you've thought about before. Hmm. And now suddenly, you know, this is what underlies reasoning not that you know not just navigation but sort of reasoning and in, in, in representation navigation and representation space so you've solved everything eventually not yet <laughs> <laughs> in the far right, future thanks very much. probably thanks for the questions Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're definitely running out of time. Uh, we do have a lot of great questions uh, in the document that I shared uh, with you, Professor Case. So uh, if you're interested in answering any of those, uh, feel sure. free to uh, go through those um, and uh, uh, put some answer there. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll get back with the answers. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, other than that, uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody participating uh, both on Zoom and YouTube. And um, yeah, I guess we'll see you next Thursday. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, next Thursday for Michael Milford's talk. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Have a good one. You too.